There is no denying that as the world's second largest economy, China's global economic influence is significant. But our next guest argues that China's impact on the world reaches far beyond the economic realm and can be better understood through the history of civilization. Martin Jakes is a senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. He's also a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. His global bestseller, When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order, was first published back in 2009. Since that time, it has been translated into 14 languages and sold more than a quarter million copies. He joins us now from Beijing with further insight on China's relationship with the United States and the rest of the Western world, and he'll explain why that relationship needs to be put into cultural and ideological frameworks. Martin, thanks so much for joining us here on Full Frame. My pleasure. Well, your book came out, and it, it, what was interesting, I think, for a lot of people who read it was that it, you didn't just focus on the economic strength of China. You also talked about the cultural aspects and uh, the political uh, influence that China can exert or change in terms of changing the uh, altering uh, the world order in a sense. How have you seen that play out since uh, your book was first published? Well, I think that uh, actually since uh, the publication uh, for, of the first edition six years ago, um, it's this, this argument in a sense has uh, reached fruition and that uh, now China has acquired the kind of econ economic power that it has, which is, you know, at least in terms of um, GDP measured by PPP, uh, China is now larger than the United States. So economically, although it's not nearly as advanced, it's a, a, a very strong economic uh, power. Um, the, the economic strength creates, uh, as it were, the foundation for the exercise of growing political power, diplomatic power, um, in intellectual influence, cultural influence, and uh, even military influence. And you can see this happening uh, with China. Now, because China it has acquired a major, I mean, is the major trading partner of virtually all, not quite all, but nearly all the countries in e East Asia, then there's a tremendous thirst in the region to learn Mandarin. Mandarin is seen, seen as the language by which, you know, particularly young ambitious professionals uh, can, can advance their situation because the trading links are so important, Chinese companies are becoming more important and so on. Um, so that's one, that's a, that's a linguistic expression of China's growing strength. Likewise, more and more students in this uh, region are going uh, to Chinese universities. Um, you know, I'm at the moment based at Tsinghua University in Beijing and there's a lot of international students there and in particular you know, a lot of Koreans, for example. Uh, likewise, there's a lot of Korean work, uh, pr professionals who now work in Beijing. So what's happening is, you know, if you've got a big economy, it exercises a gravitational pull, if you like, uh, on people for employment, on people because they're influenced, they want to know more about it and so on. When I was in uh, China uh, a couple of years back, a couple of young guys from the U.S., uh, one had gone to Harvard and another one, George Washington University, they're in their 20s, and they said, this is the place to be. I mean, you must be hearing a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been, when I was working on the book, it was beginning, but it was, you know, much less apparent then than it is now. Um, I mean, there's uh, people, you know, this is, the, the people are attracted by this. China still, even though the growth rate is obviously lower than it was, but 7% isn't bad, is it, compared with about 2.1% at the moment for the U.S. So the Chinese economy is still growing. So uh, this, is a, a, this is a country which is expanding, if you like, uh, expanding within itself and also expanding externally, mainly economically, but also in these other ways as well, the political, the cultural, and so on. Now, in that sense, China's a very, very interesting place to be because it's remaking itself. It's been remaking itself for quite a period now. And meanwhile, because it's achieved a certain level of development, it is, it is remaking the world. I mean, you know, China is, uh, is, is, I think, the most dynamic force in the world today, more dynamic than the United States because you know, by and large, uh, you know, you can understand the American position. The American position is that it's achieved a certain, uh, you know, great status in the world and so on. It's created many of the most important institutions in the world in terms of governance and so on. So, you know, it's, America's a more, 
uh, in that sense, more staid and more status quo and a bit more defensive, whereas China is, you know, got all the ambitions of a teenager. Martin, you say that uh, we're living in an era of contested modernity. What does that mean exactly? Ah, well, this is, I think, a very important question. You see, hitherto, I think, by and large, Western societies thought that um, at the end of the day, everyone would be like us, that there is only one way of being modern, and it's our way of being modern. The modernity is singular. It is Western modernity. So whether you're Japan or whether you're China or whether you're uh, Brazil, you're going to end up like us. Um, now, this for up to a point was not a totally unreasonable proposition because until the mid 20th century, really the only successful countries bar Japan uh, that had managed to industrialize, modernize, uh, were Western countries. But since the Second World War, especially from around about the late 1950s, 60s, of course, that picture began to change profoundly as modernization took root in lots of different countries, starting in particular with the Asian tigers, Taiwan, South Korea, you know, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, later other countries like Malaysia, Thailand, and of course, crucially, uh, China. And, uh, and the, the, the nature of these, you know, there's a view in the West that somehow modernity is simply a product of competition and markets and technology. That's not true. It's also shaped very profoundly by history and culture. So, Martin, give me an idea. What's the difference then between Chinese modernity versus a Western modernity? Well, Chinese modernity w will be a hybrid. You know, it's going to be, it, it's learnt from the West, it's learnt from other East Asian countries, but it's also rooted in, the, as it were, the soil uh, of, of China. So uh, it, it has inevitably shaped very powerfully by the historical characteristics of China, which is why, you know, we find it difficult to understand, but g expectations of governments and the exercise of governance in China is very different. The state is much stronger, and it's expected to be strong, and it's recognized that it's right to be uh, strong. And, and you were saying earlier, and I want to go back to this point, that uh, it's only been recently that it's been kind of viewed as a traditional nation state. Before that, pretty much, and, and even today, civilization state is, is more the term you like uh, for China. Can you explain the difference and, and why that's so important? Yeah, I mean, well, the way in which people see themselves is not simply a product. I mean, China's really only been a nation state since the late 19th century, early 20th century, which is, ve you know, in historical terms, is an extremely short period in the history of China. So that the characteristics which shape China uh, are not the characteristics of the last 120 years. They are, they are of the last 2,000 years or longer. Now, what am I talking about here? Confucian values, the re this very distinctive relationship between the state and society very uh, different and distinctive notion uh, of the family. Uh, what, what, what the, China, the word the Chinese like to use, guanxi. Guanxi is about uh, relationships, which are very important in China. So it's much more, whereas the United States is a rule-based society and you have a few million lawyers and all that kind of thing, uh, in, in, in China it's much more a relationship based society or even the language if you look at the language the language is very you know it's a very old language one of the uh, earliest written languages um, and it's very distinctive because actually there are in a sense many different languages spoken in China which they call dialects but they're you know uh, someone speaking Cantonese can't understand someone who's speaking uh, Mandarin but the, the written script the characters are shared characters so although the spoken language is often is very diverse, the actual written language is common across China. Uh, or take, you know, Chinese food or chopsticks or traditional Chinese medicine, all these things which really profoundly shape what China is, what the Chinese feel about themselves, who they think they are, comes not as a res from the recent period of being a nation state, but the much longer period of being a civilization state. 
Martin, one of the questions I want to ask you is, you know, China, you, you said relationship-based, and, and China's relationship with the developing world is, is very different from the way it's relating to the West. And, and, and we think of the African continent, where, where China has a, a, a rather large footprint now. Um, how has that altered, uh, you know, the worldview, and, and how is that altering things, and why the importance on the developing world, do you think? Well, I think China's problems have been those that of a developing country. Therefore, it has a great insight into the problem of developing countries. It is, bar none, easily the most successful example of a developing country in the last 30, 40 years of global history, without any doubt whatsoever. I mean, no other country's grown, you know, at 10% a year for more or less every year for 35 years and achieved these kind of economic results. I mean, there's no other developing country which, you know, has suddenly arrived with a huge population, arrived on the global scene uh, with the kind of influence that, and footprint uh, that China has got. Therefore, I think it feels a strong affinity with, uh, other, with other developing countries. And I think it has, because of this, also a great insight into what the problems of a developing country are. And, you know, Ch China's emphasis is on the crucial importance of economic growth, crucial importance of investment, crucial importance of infrastructure. And in a way, what the Chinese offer is to these societies is exactly that, you know, that we can, we can help you uh, develop. And of course, you know, the biggest single factor probably in Africa's progress in the last 10 years or 15 years even, has been the arrival of China and Chinese trade and Chinese investment and Chinese know-how. Know -how. Uh, it's been very important in Africa's development, but not only in Africa, you can see this in other countries as well, uh, like in other parts of the world, like Latin America. Um, and I think you're going to see it really profoundly in the next uh, 10 years or so in Central Asia, you know, uh, in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, that area, Afghanistan. I mean, you know, I think that the Chinese will probably, uh, the Chinese will bring development to these societies. Now, the Western record is much worse. You know, the, because, and I think the, re, the one, I mean, this is a complicated question, but one of the reasons why the Western record is much worse is because they're developed societies. And in some profound way, they don't really understand developing societies. I mean, though, you know, in the West, we're very happy to, happy to lecture them, but I don't think the lectures are very effective because we just don't get it in a way. We well, don't know what they need. Well, the Chinese do know what they need. What are the consequences on both sides from this kind of uh, looking at China only solely through the Western prism? Well, we don't understand it. It's as simple as that. If you only look at China through a Western prism, you can't make sense of China. We, we don't understand, because we don't try and understand China in its own terms, but we try and see China through, always through our own lens, then, you know, that's why we get it wrong. I mean, we, but and what, what this means is that we project onto China our own agenda, our own priorities, our own way of seeing, and seeing the world. So if you have a ch discussion on China, very quickly, if it's from a Western point of view, it's about human rights. Um, or it's about the overweening powers of the state or something like that. Now, I'm not saying I'm a Western, you know, I'm not saying human rights don't matter, but the way the Chinese view the question would be rather different. They would say, well, look, you know, we've taken 600 million people out of poverty over the last 35 years, and uh, this is, e the huge, by a, a way, the largest proportion of people globally that have been taken out of poverty, and you know, if people want to, you know, the basic foundation stone for people having human rights is the right to eat, the right to be able to live and have a decent, you know, a, an escape from poverty. And in that sense, I would say, well, the Chinese have probably made a bigger contribution to human rights globally, given that they've got 20 percent of the world's population, than anyone else. Now, you know, so we, we don't we don't talk the, the language and the conceptual approach where well, they don't connect up because we're thinking of this guy who's been imprisoned or this writer that's you know been incarcerated and why shouldn't he why should he be incarcerated because he's just expressing uh, his own views and so that's the way we come at it and the Chinese come at it in a different way Martin? now I think broadly speaking in that argument I mean both sides are, 
uh, both sides are have got, uh, of course, uh, a strong uh, uh, claim to be right uh, from from different positions. But I think, given the developmental picture, the Chinese are more right than the West. Martin, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for such a lively discussion. It's been great to have you on the broadcast. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll be right back with a look at one of the most important opportunities for cooperation between the United States and China, a collective effort to save the planet. Oh! <laughs>